Welcome everyone to our Saints Talk today by Dr. Silvia Paracini. Silvia graduated from the University of Pavia, went to Oxford and then did her postdoc at the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics, where she developed a deep interest in dyslexia genetics. In 2011, she was awarded a prestigious Royal Society University Research Fellowship and she set up her own research group here in St Andrews. Currently, Sylvia is the co-director of the Institute of Behavioural and Neural Sciences and in 2022, she founded the Specific Learning Difficulties Network, a multidisciplinary initiative aimed at coordinating all the research related to dyslexia. Today, one in 10 children have difficulties learning to read, even when provided with an adequate learning environment and without any other cognitive or sensory impairments. We know that the earlier a child with dyslexia is identified, the more effective ed educational interventions are likely to be. But identifying dyslexia in young children can be difficult for both parents and teachers because the signs and symptoms are not always obvious. Today, Sylvia will talk us through the research of her group at St Andrews and she will explain the latest cutting edge approaches and research into the genetics of dyslexia. Sylvia will talk and then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions, so please post them in the chat. So, welcome Dr Sylvia Paracini, thank you very much for joining us and over now to you. Good evening everybody and thank you Tanya for such a warm introduction. So as Tanya said, I'm a human geneticist, my main interest in specific learning difficulties and more specifically, my work focus on dyslexia. So on these slides, you see my, the overview of our research program and how we operate. And this immediately should give you the idea that the kind of work we do is highly multidisciplinary. Uh, we use many different approaches, but that doesn't mean that we all do everything in our lab, but actually means that we collaborate with many, many people and we work as part of large cross-disciplinary and international collaborations. So everything starts with children with dyslexia. So, and really, I don't see the children myself. What happens is that we do the analysis of their DNA in our lab. But to do that, we work with many clinicians who see the children themselves, and takes lots of detailed assessment on the children. And this, as we'll see through the talk, is a very powerful and important approach. So we need very lots of data, but also high quality data. What we then do in our lab is really focusing on the genetics. So we are interested in finding what variation in the DNA might contribute to dyslexia. And the idea is that through the genetic work, we can understand a little bit better how the brain functions and feedback this information back to the people with dyslexia, to our clinician, and try to find a way to better understand dyslexia, to better do assessment and to better manage it. But let's start with some facts about dyslexia. So it is a very common condition. So it is estimated that up between five and ten children, school age children, have uh, difficulties in learning to read. And it has to be very specific. So it's not problem in learning to read, which can be explained by other causes such as lack of opportunity in learning, other sensory problems. So it has to be very specific. What we know is that most people with dyslexia tend to have close relatives with dyslexia as well. And this is already telling us that there is a strong genetic component. So the prevalence of dyslexia among those who already have first degree relatives goes up to 40%. It, is, it has a higher prevalence in male, and this is also something that we observe in other um, neurodevelopmental conditions, such as um, language difficulties, autism, and other neurodevelopmental traits. And what we also know from tweet studies is that we can actually estimate the proportion of this genetic component in contributing to dyslexia, which is actually as high as 70%. So there is a strong genetic underlying component contributing to dyslexia. 
but it's not so easy to define these lexes. We're going to see through the talk and also these lexes tend to co-occur with other conditions, mainly with dyscalculia, which is specific difficulties in operating with numbers, but also with language problem. So having given you some facts on dyslexia, being a geneticist, I also have to give you some facts of um, the human genome. And here I have to uh, maintain my enthusiasm because every time I think about this number, you know, my brain just gets blown away. So bear with me if I'm just getting a little bit too excited here. But every time I think about it, you know, every cell of our body, mine, yours, and every part of our body, we have nucleus containing DNA. And this DNA is a 3.2 billion sequence of four letters. So we have four molecules, and depending on their sequence, we code uh, all sorts of information that are necessary for life. And every cell of our body has this amount of information, which is super coiled, they're organized in 46 chromosomes. So what is really mind blowing is if we were to take out this DNA from each cell and stretch it to a line, this would be long two meters. And if we put all the DNA in our body, single body, we can get you know, to the sun and back and to the solar system. So we have lots of DNA in our body. Every time a cell is divided, this DNA is copied and our cells are pretty good to copy correctly. And every time a protein needs to be generated, some bits of DNA open and there is a machinery that copy the DNA, translating to a protein. Differences in the DNA are the difference that are the blueprint of make, what makes us different, what makes us human and what um, determine the differences in the color of our hair, color of our eyes, our behavior, some preferences, and sometimes changes in the DNA also causes diseases, as we know. But they also change how we operate in more complex way. So I'm going to try to stop here. Uh, the last point I need to mention is that we have 20 times so contribute to um, have the information to generate at least 20,000 different proteins. Now, how much of variation there is in the human genome? So with more technology, more data, we have catalogued up to 30 millions of these variants. And the question is, what of these variants are relevant for a disease, for a trait or for dyslexia? And with technology, we have different ways in which we look at these mutations. Sometimes with some of these mutations are actually very frequent, so we call them polymorphism. And I'm going to start to talk of what you see on the left column. So we refer to single nucleotide polymorphism. These are variants that are quite frequent in the population. And it's another case is we need to discover these mutations because they're very rare. So we need to resequence the genome. But let's start with the polymorphism. So because they are known, they, we can actually already say, develop some techniques where we put up to one million of markers for these different variants and test them in different people. So we already know what are variable and we just test which one each person care. And the idea is that even if these variants are common, the combination of some variant might increase the risk or the propensities to some disease or some trait. And this is a very well established technique. If we wanted to do that, we can just use something like a microscope slide, put some DNA, put in the machine, it costs about 25 pounds per sample, and we can generate lots of these data. I will give you more detail about this sequencing. I just put the, the table here for comparison, but I'm going to start talking about these common variants for this. Um, so as you get from this data, we have 30 million of these uh, variants in the genome. We have a way to genotype them, but you understand immediately that we're talking about lots of data. 
So to find some of these effects or this association between DNA changes and some trait, condition or disease, we need huge sample. So and this is something that there is not a single lab that can do this kind of study. We need to work in big consortium. This is one of the things I mentioned. So our group is part of the Gene Lung Consortium, which means that we have the biobank in here in St. Andrews for different collection of DNA. I work with John Stein, Joe Talakot in Oxford and Reading, Maggie Snowling in York, and also I'll, I use data from a bird court based in Bristol. And our lab contribute this amount of sample, few thousand sample, which we put them together with other labs and we reach the size of 34,000 sample who are really carefully assessed for reading measures. So then with this number of sample, we generate the data, put DNA on these microscope uh, slides, put them in the machine, get the data back and try to see if any of these variants are associated with these legs. So now probably you expect my, my next slide to be a mind blowing result of showing how many genes we found through this approach. But the reality is that we found none. So now um, I got to explain you a little bit how this plot works. So these are, are called Manhattan plot. Any human genetic paper you will see will have a plot of this kind and it's quite easy to interpret them. So they are man called Manhattan plot because they are really trying to look for high signal. So some of these dots going above this red line resembling skyscraper as in Manhattan. So what these dots are, each dot is one of these variants that we have genotype in the human genome and they are organized around the chromosome. So here we have our 21 chromosomes. There are 21 because we don't analyze with these methods the X and the Y chromosome. And on the Y axis is the statistical association of the, each of these markers with the trait of interest. In this case, this legs. So the highest, the, the marker, the strongest the association. So we are really trying to find some marker along the genome that would cross this line. So what this plot is saying is that in spite of having collected all these high quality samples, we don't find any gene and probably because the effects are small and we don't have the power to detect them. But this year we, did, we took another approach and this was work led by my colleague Michelle Luciano in Edinburgh where she didn't find not one, not two, but 42 of genes associated with this lexin. How did she do that? Well, we use very rough measure, so you have to balance high quality measure in relatively small sample of crude measure in huge data. Where did we get this huge data? We use a company, direct to consumer, 23andMe, where people, including myself, pay to get their um, genotype being generated and participate into research. And from our study, from clinical data where we had about 2,000 cases and 600 control. Maybe we moved to something with 50,000 cases and over a million of controls. And this huge sample gave us the power to identify these genes associated with dyslexia. Now, what does this mean? What do these genes do? So about 50% of these genes have been previously reported to be associated with cognitive abilities, and that's not a surprise. But some of these have never been reported before and already hint of some specific association with dyslexia. All we can say about these genes is that they seem to be expressed in the brain, involved in neurodevelopment. So there are no big surprises and nothing much we can infer from the function of these genes. But what we did is then taking this gene and go back in our clinical court and see if we could replicate this association. What we found is that about half of these 42 genes and 32 of the dyslexia specific one replicated both in our clinical court and also in an independent court collected in China. So we are relatively confident that we'll start getting some genuine signal. But what we can do with this data, we can also say if there are some sorts of genetic correlation. What does genetic correlation mean? Is that you take two population with 
genetic data, phenotypic or trait data, and you ask if the people are more genetically similar, will they also look more similar at the outcome level, at the phenotypic level? And then you can compare different traits and see if there are some shared genetic overlap. And what we see is something that we expect, again, suggesting that we are on track. So what we see is that the genetics contributing to dyslexia seem to overlap to genetic factor find associated with education, outcome and education, cognition, some brain measure. But in unexpectedly, we, saw, we found strong correlation with the genetic of pain. What does that mean? We don't know yet, but no Michelle team is following up this finding. But something very interesting for to me is that one of the strongest signals was found with handiness. So when we saw these results, we got very excited because that's another part of my um, uh, keen interest of my research. So let's take a step back and check why we are interested in handiness when we talk about this lexa. So this is not particular original idea, and in fact, for over a century, research I'll try to dissect this link because there have always been the intuition that somehow brain asymmetries would be linked to this lexa. Why? Because as I'm talking and as you're listening to me, you're using predominantly one of your two hemispheres. And if you're right-handed, there is a very high chance that you're going to be using mainly your left hemisphere. We know that pe in people with dyslexia, these asymmetry can be flipped and it's more free. Well, majority of left handers will still use their, um, I'm getting confused, their left hemisphere, but there is a higher proportion of left handers who will have language dominance in their right hemisphere. And this is telling us that, first of all, the brain is asymmetric. There is a strong asymmetry for language. These asymmetries are somehow linked with handiness. And we're trying to ask how can we dissect at a more specific level these links. So that's why researchers for a long time tried to find a link with handiness, brain asymmetry, and dyslexia, which is a language associated trait. So these are uh, we follow up this research because we thought that we could somehow answer some of these questions using a genetic approach. So before going into much uh, detail with the genetics and some more specific detail with dyslexia, we wanted first of all to define the baseline of what would be left handedness frequency across population. So this is a study that we carry out with, um, again, collaborators, and we collected data across 2.4 million people, analyzed them, and we come up with this magic number of 10.6, which is the frequency of left handedness across humans. And what is quite incredible is that these 10.6% is very fixed and it tends to be very similar across population. Where it is lower, it's still because there is some strong stigma persisting against left handedness. So we see lower frequency of left handedness sometimes in Asian population, and that's because there is still a stigma against left handedness. But if we go back in our history, probably it's not been uncommon to hear some grandparents left handed who were asked to switch and use their right hand for writing because it was considered a really bad habit to use their left hand. So there has also been stigma in our population in the past against left handedness. So another thing to bear in mind is that for now I've been talking about hand preference for writing, but if you think about different tasks, for example, drinking or uh, throwing, drawing, ironing, if you do iron, um, and if you think or brushing your teeth, most of you will use their dominant hand to do all these tasks. 
but some of you will use different hands to do different tasks. And in this case, we refer to mixed handedness. So when we combine left handedness and mixed handedness, that proportion goes as high as 18%. So is handedness, uh, as that, does handedness have a genetic component? Yes. Again, it's more prevalent in males, as we mentioned for dyslexia, but the genetic for handiness tend to be lower. Um, the irritability of handiness tend to be lower than dyslexia. So it, from twin study, we estimate it to be around 25%. So having discussed some of these facts around handiness, we really want to ask the question, is handiness or perhaps left handiness, because that's assumption, associated with dyslexia. And again, for decades, researchers have tried to find the links and results have been very, very inconsistent. And there are reasons for that is because there are differences in how dyslexia is classified, because as you can imagine, that's not easy. That might depend on the language, that might depend on different criteria. It depends on handiness is classified because, as I mentioned, it might be straightforward if you ask somebody um, what hand you use for writing. But if we think if handiness sometimes is categorized using quantitative approach or asking these sorts of questions or using different tasks, then we have differences. The same data have been analyzed with different statistical methods, giving different results. But most importantly, most studies have been conducted in very small studies, which we know will give to bias. So what we did instead is going back to this cohort of 34,000 participants, which were originally collected for genetic study, but they are very they are characterized in very detail um, in a very detailed way, including with endiness measure. So what we were able to do in the 34,000 34, sample was to define very homogeneous criteria so that we would define people with dyslexia in the same way across different courts. We would be very specific in defining who is left-handed or right-handed, and we would be equally very specific in defining who are our controls, so who is not classified as dyslexic. So these are the results of this study, which was led by PhD student Philippe Papandance in my lab. So we were able to uh, pull out from the diff this different court, define our case in control, measure handiness. And what we find is that, yes, there is an association between um, reading and language impairment here with we, we find them and left handiness. But this association is very small, so the other ratio are real, are only 1.2. So there is a small increase of left handedness in individuals who have reading and language impairment. Now we're following this up in a much bigger sample. So we have collected more than 6,000 individuals and 41,000. So this is looking beyond our consortium collaboration. But what is astonishing is that the odd ratio and the results is exactly the same. So we've been able to replicate this data. But what we have the power to do in this sample is to identify that most of this signal is driven by the mixed handedness. So it's not the left handedness, but it's perhaps losing a little bit of asymmetries when we start using both hands equally. So to finish this part of the talk, so we look some um, with this approach working with big teams and our clinician and combining big data with crude graph phenotype, also taking advantage of much more detailed assessment, we've been able to find some gene associated with dyslexia, finding some genetic correlation across traits and also then redefining how we can look at ask this question at behavioral level again looking in big sample and something that is very exciting for me is really starting to find this pattern between brain asymmetry handiness and dyslexia so now i'm gonna go back 
to this table, which I mentioned. So, so far we've been talking about the kind of common variants, the one that we can put on a chip, but we know that there are also lots of these rare variants. And with the technology, with our ability to re-sequence sample, so here we don't know which variant we're looking, but we have to go in the genome and re-sequence it and try to, to discover them. We know that more and more these rare variants have been associated with all sorts of traits and conditions. So the question is, are these single mutation with bigger effect, could they be influenced this legacy? So these study haven't been done yet. Uh, so we have been really doing the first big study, which we complete a few weeks ago. And I'm going to share with you some unpublished data and hopefully some of my current ex excitement of doing this kind of research. So thinking a little bit what we're looking at. So I mentioned we're looking for a mutation with big effect. So if they have big effects, they will tend to be in individual with more severe phenotype, but also they will be shared with their family relatives. So we should expect to see the effect of this mutation also in their relative that they will have passed down the mutation and they share the same mutation with them. So the, one of the collection of samples, the one collected in Oxford by John Stein, was started in the 1990s when we didn't know yet about what to expect by the human genome. But in, the, in his clinic, John was seeing lots of families coming uh, to self-refer themselves for having dyslexia and seeing dyslexia in multiple relatives. So that's when John and my previous mentor, Professor Tony Monaco, they started to collect DNAs in these families. So this family has very specific phenotype to enter the study. The, the children, they have to have an IQ uh, normal and quite often it's above average, so above 100%, but they're very severe in their reading. So they tend to be below minus two standard deviation in their reading performance. And also in the family, they have multiple affected individuals. So I happen to have this family, which now I look after here in St. Andrews. So I thought this, if there are mutations with this big effect, these will be the families where we're going to find them. So we select the 57 most severe individuals fit in this criteria and we sequence them. So this time when you sequence, you do send the DNA in little tube to a company. So they put them in a sequential and then they send you back the data physically in a hard drive. And then you have to make sense of the data, the kind of data we got back by sequencing these 57 individuals plus family member is about one terabyte of data. You're looking at all 20,000 genes in the genome, which is roughly 180,000 exons, the bits component the gene. This is only 1% of the human genome, but still it means looking through 30 million base pair of the genome. And what we found, if I had to sequence myself or any of you roughly, you will see that each of us will have about 20,000 variants in our genes. And the question is, are any of these variants relevant to this lexicon? So Christoph Mariansky, PhD student in my lab, is a very talented uh, data scientist. He's funded by Medical Research Scotland in collaboration with Canon. So he's been able to set up very clever pipeline to reduce this huge amount of data to something more manageable. But even so, so we filter out all the variant that the frequency above 100% human population the one that we predicted to have no effect, so we only took, kept the one with damaging effect on protein. And even so, we remain with about, we put it down to about 10 or 12 mutations in each person across 553 genes. So now this is still a lot because how do we know which of these might be relevant to this selection? Well, to our astonishment, what happened was, 
the recap scene two genes coming up. And this is what gives you confidence that perhaps these two genes might be linked to dyslexia. Now, I know you're going to hate me for this. I would hate if somebody would do that. I would hate that person. But I hope you will understand at this stage, I cannot share the name of the genes with you. Uh, but you have to believe me, there are two genes and hopefully in a few months you're going to see the publication. The reason I cannot share is because um, we're considering whether or not it's worth filing a, a patent related to this work. So there is some issue on confidentiality, but um, hopefully we will be, be able to share soon more data. But what is sufficient to say here is that for these two genes, one was mutated in eight, family, eight families out of these 57, and the second gene, it was actually exactly the same mutation coming up in five different families. And when we look at the segregation it, for the individuals for whom we have the data, it did follow the pattern. It was consistent. So, for example, in this family, the mutation is passed from mom, which we had a question mark, possibly both mom and dad have dyslexia, but we're not sure because we only phenotype the children. Both the affected children that were sequenced at the mutation. Unfortunately, we don't have the DNA of the third sibling. But this is another case where we, we sequence all three children and the two who are affected have the mutation and the third doesn't. And in this case, we have a family where the affected individuals carry both mutation, and which was passed down from the father who also a suspected dyslexia. So, so far so good. I can tell you we sequenced some controls where we did not find this mutation. So this gives us some confidence in the data. So the next step, we really want to uh, take forward the results and we're looking in the UK Biobank, which is a huge collection of half million people, and we might be able to link this data with um, more complex uh, measure like brain images. And again, we have all DNA and this is work carried out by Professor Christy Felp. I'm not going to share detail with you. It's just giving you an idea of the size of the data. And finally, specific learning difficulties network, which Tanya mentioned, because this is something that we think is important because if we want to raise the profile of this condition, we want to call it better coordinated research, which, as you know, by now required the, the engagement with different research group, multidisciplinary approaches. But we want to design research together with the stakeholders. So we don't want to do research and then fit it in a box, but we want to generate and design research with this sort of input from the very beginning. So our network, you can look uh, up online, but we define five working groups specifically, and we have different type of project in each of them. I'm just going to go very quickly, but this is really defining the research priority with the stakeholders. We have strong focus on teaching, so we have delivered last Friday workshop with teacher to try to develop what resources might be more useful for them. We're doing a mapping exercise to understand all data and codes that might be available so that we can capitalize on existing data to look of what um, we could take advantage of what is already there or perhaps made the case of funding to set up something new. Terminology, because we need consensus to be able to talk to each other and technology. So AI is going to play a role in this and we want to think what are the best technology that might support people with dyslexia research. So finally, I talk a lot about dyslexia, but there are also other learning difficulties. So this article was in The Guardian a few weeks ago. Our collaborator, Professor Marcus Nolan, made the case also that we need to look beyond dyslexia, in particular dyscalculia, and we do need to raise the profile of this condition because this is a virtual cycle. So we need awareness. We need to influence policy maker and also funding body so that, that we can generate research that is useful and can influence research and decision.
So these are a kind of snapshot from our activities. So we launched the network in November. Uh, here, one of the highlights is that for the first time we've been able to bring together in the same room representative of the two cross-party groups from both Westminster. So we have here Tom Hickson, Higgins, Ford, Sharon Option MP from Westminster and Oliver Mundell from Holyrood. And also these are snapshots from last Friday. So here we are in the room with the teacher discussing with them what would be their need. And we had a keynote lecture with a panel, including young dyslexic ambassador. So we were really, really pleased by the enthusiasm and the support we have by the stakeholder and looking forward to work with them. And with this, I really like to go back from where we started. So uh, just to conclude, really what I show you is uh, you know, we do lots of work with many, many different teams, many player clinicians and bioinformaticians, molecular biology, cognitive neurosciences, really having this high quality measure can help us set some of the link, but we also need big data. We think that now it's time to combine the common variant with the real variant. We might open the pathway to better understand the brain, but also we need to engage with the stakeholders. So these results might be difficult to communicate. We want to communicate them properly. We don't want to say, for example, all left-handers are going to be dyslexic because that's something that can go in the headline. So we want to be mindful and be able to communicate these results properly, but also get an input from our for our research and that was our motivation to set up the network. So I'm probably gonna stop there. And uh, if that's okay, I might stop sharing so I can also see you on the screen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sylvia. That was so interesting. Um, so there's a question here about what is the prevalence of dyslexia um, you know, is it the same across countries, different countries, or, how, you know, how can you measure that? Yeah, so that's a great question because most of what I refer to is about English speaking country, but as we work with international group, we see these differences. These are some of the challenges in putting sample together. So now make an example, which is pretty easy to understand. So as you know, you gather from my accent, I'm Italian. So if you read in Italian, it's very really different. Learning to read in Italian is very really different because we don't make mistakes. When it's more difficult to make mistakes. Because there is only one way in which you read words in Italian. But people with dyslexia in Italian will tend to be much slower, so they need more time. While in English, you, people with dyslexia will tend to make more dyslexia because there is not a direct one-to-one -one correlation between how the way it's written and how a phoneme is read. So it's more complicated. And this difference intrinsic to the language will also influence the prevalence. So I would say, for example, in Italy, the prevalence will be a little bit lower, but some people who are not dyslexic in Italian might struggle to read in different languages because of the difference and the different challenges attached to some languages. That's so interesting. And you mentioned in your talk, there's a higher prevalence in males. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, is there anything around the X chromosome there? Because Well, that's uh, that's a great question. So like, as you are mentioning for the um, common variant, the X chromosome tend to be overlooked because cannot be analyzed in the same way as the other chromosome. So that's the obvious place where to look and we haven't done enough research yet there. So that's an area that is going to be explored. So there might be something on the X chromosome, but at the moment we cannot give much uh, detail on that because we don't have enough data there. Mm. And then it's really fascinating, the evidence around handiness. Is there a genetic component for that as well? Yeah, so it is lower for the, so from twins data, we estimate it to be around 25%, which is about a quarter, but it's not such a clear pattern. So it's not, it's more difficult to see a kind of um, 
pattern within families. So there's going to be a genetic component, but it's lower, for example, than if we compare it with dyslexia. But if, yeah. We, yeah, if we look into the future, it's amazing mm. news about this. You've identified these genes. I mean, what, what's the next steps? Uh -huh. So, um, so there are two ways to look at it. One, you can predict if somebody might be a higher risk, because one thing that we know is that earlier intervention is the best way to mitigate potential issue because you can start training, you could use technology and you've just got children their best chance you can retrain. Also, another important thing is that by showing that there is a biological component, a genetic component, we're saying that it's not bad parenting, it's not bad teaching, it's just accepting that there is something that we function in different ways, just how we get around it. So having that knowledge uh, you know, it's nobody's fault. They're just genetic and actually you can make the most of it because some people with dyslexia might have some other quality. For example, the many can say that they have different spatial awareness. So you might be able to think what are your strengths. But really knowing that there is a higher risk for dyslexia might give uh, the opportunity to implement some specific training or specific um, plan on how to get around it and to make the most of um, the situation. So it's that's what we could do. There's not going to be a pill <laughs> or, mm -hmm. you know, it's just building that knowledge and it, it will help us to understand how the brain function. Yeah, fascinating. So you use linked, associated and other uh -huh. words to describe the science. Is there an accepted set of casual relationships, DAG, that scientists use to understand the data and appropriately take into account confounders and colliders? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. So, in, in fact, we don't, I try to be very careful not saying causing because this is all about risk and it's very great place to be because there are going to be lots of different factors. And we try to control for factors, so we control for age, sex, which is pretty obvious. But we want, for example, to eliminate any other uh, primary cause that might have influence reading uh, abilities, so other sensory problem, other neurological problem, or perhaps social economical factors that might have influence or prevented access to education. So this is very complicated and it's that's also why you need big samples so that you can control for different factors. So um, a nice comment here. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Thanks. My daughter, now 27, was diagnosed at 18 as being dyspraxic. Mm -hmm. She's got no problem with reading. She's an absolute bookworm, but finds it really difficult to write coherently. She can fluently verbally explain a concept, but if she needs to write it down, it's as though a child of 12 has written it as the language mm -hmm. is basic and she is strongly left handed. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's very so, yeah. interesting. Yeah. OK, so is there any suggestion that dyslexia might be mediated through environmental epigenetic effect as well as SMPs mutations? Uh -huh. Another great question. So again, that's some ideas with any trait uh, people have looked through epigenetic effect, methylation, but we do not have that evidence. So it's possible, we are not saying uh, there is no such effect, but uh, we don't have that evidence yet. OK, and so what are the next steps then for your lab? Aha. So definitely we're going to full up this mutation. We are going to sequence the rest of the families that we have because I think this is going to be promising. So it means that we need to records <laughs> because, as I mentioned, this is going to cost something like 250 pounds per sample. And we have thousands of them to do. So that's going to be the next step. But then I want to take a, these more, more a functional level, specifically these two genes. Um, we can study them at function, functional level, we can regenerate the mutation in cells and really try to understand this factor. But And also I want to take forward this work, of, work with the network 
to look beyond my own research and really um, putting this work into context and working with others. So there is the work in the lab, but also the work with the larger community. Uh, and someone's saying thank you for a great talk. Um, what are the dates of the meeting that you mentioned in November? Aha, uh -huh. so I will need to check on my website, but I think that was the beginning of November 2022. That was the launch. Uh, but if you look on our website, there is, or you can email me and get more information about the network work. Thank you. Ah, thank you. And then a question here. Why does giving children different colored backgrounds help? Aha, uh -huh. so uh, I I don't know exactly the science of that, but for example, my collaborator John Stein is using a lot of color lenses, for example. So not everybody, but some people with dyslexia say that they see kind of the letters flowing or moving on the page. So changing the spacing, changing the font, changing the color, the contrast might help. Somebody find the color lenses helpful, but not everybody. Why is that? I don't know. So maybe that's something that we genetics we could try to answer. Okay. Um, are the genes associated with dyslexia associated with any other phenotypes? Yes. So with the common variant, what we see is that half of them have already been reported with uh, cognitive measure and specifically with ear in education. So they come up with genetic study for education, which makes sense. Then, because all these genes are brain expressed, so then they, some of them might already been reported, for example, with autism. And what this is telling us is that there is not one gene doing one thing in the brain, but there are hundreds of genes functioning in the brain and depending when and where they are switched, they might lead to different outcomes. So, this, so yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, a question here. I'm not sure if you do the wider mm -hmm. environmental work, but um, is there any relationship identified between dyslexia and smoking in pregnancy by the mother? So I believe people have looked into that, but I don't think we have this evidence. And mm. in fact, most of the, the only strong factor associated with dyslexia is really genetics. There might be environmental factors, but we do not have that evidence. And you were talking earlier about potential genetics associated with handiness, and I wondered, is there any preference for feet? Do you uh -huh. have a, is there a... So, I don't know. we look at the relationship between handiness, hand preference and foot preference, but not for foot preference and dyslexia. What I can say, is that there is a correlation between hand preference and foot preference, but it's not perfect. So the two things again of this tell you that there is this level of mix and uh, complexity. So there is always some people using preferentially one side only for everything, the other the other side, but there is always something in, in between, including for foot preference. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Silvia Paracini. It's been thank a real you. pleasure to have you on. Thank you for telling us about all of your research. Um, and to all of our guests, just to let you know, we are taking a break on Saints Talks until September and we'll be in touch when they have more information. Thank you very much, everybody, and good night. <laughs>